coming up next after two brief messages between Master and Disciples on Supreme Master Television. Gain new insights about life and the universe through words of wisdom from Supreme Master Ching Hai's spiritual lectures. If we step beyond this material existence into the world of light and reality, even just one moment, we will know that this life is not the only and is not the best life there is. Words of Wisdom from Supreme Master Ching Hai's Spiritual Lectures on Supreme Master Television. We invite you to listen to the following discussion by Supreme Master Ching Hai with association members in Austin, Texas on August 27, 1994, entitled, Be Your Own Master. All of you should also, now and again, huh, remind yourselves to keep in the line, huh, to meditate well and to mind your own business. And keep the precept. And don't always talk in the meditation hours. And don't make noise, doesn't matter what reason. Sometimes you bring a plastic bag inside the meditation hall and you trouble all the people. Or sometimes your, your, your watch, you know, you have to buy the modern watch with all kind of date and, and you know, months and years. Anything. Any information on your wrist. That's fine with me. <laughs> but it reminds you every half an hour that time is running and tick, tick, tick. <laughs> That's also fine with me. But uh, it's not fine with the uh, meditating people, you know, that disturb them. I live very simple, yeah? So even, even if I don't, I don't uh, earn any money, my simplicity already earns, you know, because the penny you save is the penny you earn anyhow. So I don't think I don't have money, but I don't just don't use it. I just use it for anybody who needs it, all right? But I work for it, you see? I paint this house and I cut the grass and so this is also earning money <laughs> even though I already earn money by my artwork understand what I mean? so don't ever think that I take your money and do anything with it no I, I think you know huh? and I never ever ask you for one penny never anybody western or eastern before or after <laughs> and in between never right? okay so this is all of you everybody knows so anyhow that's that and what, what was it now? What I mean by talking and making trouble is that your own personality, you understand? For your own things. Or you could not control your own habits. That every time you go to meditation, you have to look around. See who's who. Who's next to me? Is that Asura, Asura or Buddha? <laughs> whether you affect my meditation or not. But you never consider whether you affect other people's meditation. You have to consider who you sit next to the poor. <laughs> the poor fellow who has to bear your insi inside noise. Huh? Anyhow, so mm, that was that's <laughs> that's the story. Huh? What I mean talking and making noise is that you try to be quiet at least outside. Huh? At least outside, so people don't have excuse <laughs> to scold you. <laughs> well, well, when you're noisy inside, nobody knows. <laughs> So that I cannot control. <laughs> that I cannot tell. You can only tell by yourself whether you're noisy inside or you're not noisy inside. Hmm? And that is more important even. 
but at least from the outside, you know, you keep the quiet atmosphere for other people, the good people <laughs> who make a noise only inside to meditate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then when you keep the atmosphere quiet, then at least these good people, they have the time and the uh, quiet it to check up their inside noise. You know what I mean? If you always make noise outside, how can I check their inner noise? All right, so that's also your fault. Okay? <coughs> now, <coughs> understand? And what I mean by talking and arguing is that you just argue over everything. You know what I mean? Not because of the benefit of the public, but because you just don't want to listen to people, even when it's right. You know what I mean? Like people say, don't make noise during meditation. Don't bring the plastic bag in the meditation hall because it makes it such a noise. And don't bring this uh, super modern watch into the meditation hall. We beep every five minutes. <laughs> so the, the, the watch always have to beep, 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 <laughs> to remind you that time is money, you know. <laughs> And you have to rush to work or rush to the supermarket or, or whatever. But in the meditation hall, you come in, you don't rush anywhere, except you rush to the Buddha's land. But that you cannot rush either. You, know? <laughs> you can only come, I can only go when the time comes, when the master takes your feet to go. Otherwise, you get dizzy or seasick or sky sick, you know, <laughs> and you go too high. Huh? Understand? Many people keep telling me, Master, you scold me, make me go fast, make me become Buddha fast. <laughs> I said, okay, scold the Buddha. You only remind the mind, you know, or scold in the habit, correcting the mind, correcting the habit, but not the Buddha, not the real you. Besides, if you beat, you beat a donkey, you know, and hit him very hard until he died, he would not even go faster than the horse. <laughs> you know what I mean? So whatever you are, accept it, try your best. Be all sincere, and then you will arrive at your destination. It doesn't matter when, all right? We are not in a hurry. We are already initiated. We keep the precepts. We meditate diligently. We will go, all right? Walking, crawling, <laughs> or flying, we will go there. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So why, why you bother, okay? You become when your time's up. Just like like the, 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 the fruit tree, yeah, it ripes and then it will ripe, okay? We can add some artificial light or, you know, uh, shield it from the wind so that it will last long until it ripes. It's all right. So that we meditate, we keep the precepts, all right? We try to check up our inner, we try to be inward all the time. That is the adding uh, system, okay? And the way to add, to add up our speed. But, but otherwise, we cannot every day scold the, the, the apple tree or apple, tell, it, tell him to drive quickly. Can we do that? <laughs> huh? Even we add all the artificial light, light and all kind of uh, add that we can give, then let it be, right? Still it takes time, right? The apple just grow up that big. Even if you add a thousand watts, you know, <laughs> artificial light, and every day you fan it, or you <laughs> decide the Buddha's name on top of it, it still cannot uh, ripe so quickly, you know? It has to grow up and then ripe, maybe faster a little bit, but not that fast. Huh? Like the child you just born, about that big. Huh? Uh. And then <laughs> you push him to run or to ride bicycle, or, or to even to... Uh, uh, a drive airplane. Can you do that? Doesn't matter how hurry you are, huh? Or, or how much you want your children to be a genius, or to grow up quickly, or to do things the way you please, is not to be done. Is that right? Okay. So take it easy. Just do your job. Hmm? You know yourself that you're sincere and honest, and the Buddha knows. Don't you think the Buddha knows? Don't you think God knows? Do Do you think you have to have to blah 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 all the time? <laughs> Bother him, huh? Don't you think the mother knows the children are hungry? Huh? The mother knows, but sometimes a little bit slower or quicker because the mother is busy a little bit of something. And even if the child is hungry, one more second or one more minute, it doesn't make that much difference. 
Understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I, I'm trying very hard. My job is hard. I read books even, <laughs> so that I can uh, tell you some stories because I don't have them all in my head. I forget them all. Yeah? When I was young, uh, everything I learned once, I read once, I remember right away. Therefore, I was always first or second in the class. Yes, I don't study at home because I had a super memory. And now I have a super bad memory. <laughs> I learn everything I forget. I read the books I forget. I don't know why. Must be getting old, huh? Or too much of the disciples. <laughs> I have no, no, more, no more space <laughs> for memory. Just remember you, your name and your problem. Huh? Okay. But that's good to forget also. Huh? Otherwise, too much of worldly knowledge doesn't help much. It encourages us sometimes to meditate yeah? and to try to find our, our inner wisdom. That's fine, but we can't always carry it. We can't always carry our car wherever we go. Right? We arrive in the house and then we can't carry the car inside the bedroom. No? We have to leave it in the garage, right? And whenever we need it again, we use it. Hmm. Suppose you go into the supermarket and carry your bicycle all the time on your, on your shoulder, is that okay? <laughs> Just because the bicycle helps you so much, <laughs> carry you to the supermarket, and then, and then you carry it all over on the cheese counter, <laughs> on the vegetable counter, is that okay? People think you're kaput here. <laughs> Okay, so now let's become serious, talking about Buddha's things. Uh, we will have a look at how other disciples uh, search for masters and search for enlightenment, how they did it. Yeah. Some, of course, like Mila Reba and other Telopa, these people, they have been famous worldwide and thousands of years because of their uh, endurance, endurance during the time they search for a master. And their master also have become very famous for being very, very extremely strict and cruel to these disciples in order to cleanse their karma and to bring them up to the highest level of enlightenment. Okay? We don't talk about these extreme cases because that will scare you. Hmm? It scares me. It scares me what kind of disciple I have <laughs> and what I was <laughs> supposed to do but never did, you know. And I just go a little bit and people, people already get mad with me. Hmm? Okay, now, Teloba, you remember? Oh, what I told you about the story, about the, the bad, uh, the, the very, uh, very, uh, Suffering disciple is his Naropa, not Tilopa. Tilopa is his master. And Milarupa master is uh, Mapa, yeah? Tilopa was a man of, of uh, knowledge. Mm. He, he knows all the sutras, I mean, all the Bible, all the books of wisdom at that time, of his time. And everywhere he goes, people worship him because he has such an eloquence and such a wide knowledge of books, <laughs> okay, books, bookworms, hmm. one of the bookworms. <laughs> but he was so, so learned, you know, that people so worship him because nobody else at that time was better. Most of the people who are enlightened would never come out and debate <laughs> anyhow. Most of the people who know don't talk <laughs> and the people who talk don't know. Of course, those masters like uh, Buddha, the Jesus, they went and preached. But that is different. That's, they have to do it, otherwise they don't want to. You know what I mean? Their mission is like that. Even though they suffer, <laughs> they don't want it. Yes. But that doesn't mean they always go out and seeking the opportunity to debate. That is a different. You understand what I mean? They would abhor and run away from such an opportunity. Yeah? They just have to do their job to teach their disciples you know, those ever come to them. But they would not go out and argue with other people to show off their knowledge. That is a different capish. Yeah, okay. Now, this Tilopa was one of those who run around all India and showing off his knowledge of books. 
and everywhere he go, he won. Nobody ever can win him because he was so, his knowledge of books was so extensive. Well, in many countries we have these people, yeah? Not only Jalopa. Just one day he was, uh, according to the legion, eh? mm. he was staying in his house and reading one of the most famous and valuable books at that time. And then there was one beggar, the old woman beggar, when, uh, some of you already know this story, no? Yes? Oh, this story you can read from Indian Sutra, also from many of the books and also, this is the book I'm reading from the story for you. This story I know a long time ago, but you know, in India, I know many stories, and which they also uh, uh, rewritten in some of the books like the Many of the, the books you can read, like The Way of the White Cloud, and the, this is a book called The Mystic of Tibet from Ma Madame Alessandra David New. Maybe you are like me, you read and you forget. It's, it's true. This book I read uh, uh, about 10 years before, 15 years before, but I, I still reread it now just because I forget. I want to tell you this story I forgot, okay? in case I forget some of the details. Mm. So now Tilopa uh, was reading the, this valuable book and then the, the beggar, the old woman, looked filthy and, you know, very skinny, no, no food and, you know, very undernourished, <laughs> uh, went on, uh, passed by him and tell him, tell him something like, ah, you're reading so passionately, like that, but do you ever understand any bit of it? <laughs> <laughs> and then Teloba was very stolid, you know, such an old and ugly beggar, and dare talk like this in front of a pandit like me, you know, a learned professor like me, and he was kind of, uh, you know, stolid and didn't know what to react yet. And then the woman, old beggar woman, spit <laughs> into his book and went away. <laughs> wow! Huh? And then he was so angry because he, she dared speak into this holy book, you know? And then so he ran, she, she, he ran after her. But when he ran after her, she just uh, murmured something in, in her mouth, in her, in her throat. And suddenly he became cool, cool down. He did not feel angry anymore. Mm. And then he stopped. He stopped there. He went back home and started to think. Maybe he feels something wrong. He felt maybe something that is not correct about the way he's learning books. Yeah? So he was thinking, thinking very hard. Mm. And then, and he was also thinking very hard, how come an old beggar woman dare speak into the holy book? which all India revere, yeah, since thousand years. People even worship in front of the book, you know, and offering money to the book. They still do that nowadays in some of the country, including India, which I know, I have seen. They would just bow to the book, offer money and flower to the book, <laughs> and believing that is all there is about knowledge and wisdom. But the books is the book. You are you. How can you bow to the book and get anything from it? Huh? Can you believe it? But many people believe it. Anyhow, that's their business. Mm. So this, this Teloba was thinking very hard and then finally, you know, and he was also surprised how come an old woman so weak and just murmur one or two sentences and his anger, which was like fire. He is very bad tempered, this man. Later you will know the, how he tricked his disciple in Naropa, yeah? Oh, he beat him, he scold him, and he, oh, he do all kinds of things to Naropa until he became enlightened. Naropa is his disciple later, the one that he treated badly. I guess this story I told a really long time ago about Naropa, how he suffered under the hand of his master. But he became very compassionate master, and very kind and gentle, Naropa. So I remember that I told you this Naropa story already a long time ago. 
so after some time, so considering he uh, he left his job, huh? He left his job. <laughs> I don't argue anymore. He went all over to search for the the old woman, the beggar, trying to find out what is it that he did not understand. So one day he found her in the in the jungle alone. Mm. And then he tried to argue with her and use his eloquence and knowledge to beat her in the argument in the jungle. But doesn't matter how hard he tried, she always won. The old, ugly, poor, undernourished beggar always <laughs> won. <laughs> uh, so, so, finally, she told him that the things I know, the wisdom that I possessed and understood is not in the books. You cannot find it. So therefore you can never argue with me. <laughs> so finally he, he bowed to her and accepted her as master and asked her to teach, to teach him. And then he saw she did. she did. So what she told him finally is that, Whatever you want to know is not in the books and it's not in this world. So you have to go and find heavenly beings to learn with. So the way is initiation, right? And then we go up inside and we found these heavenly beings. That's what it means. And then we learn with them. Is that not so? Yes. Even I teach you, even any master teach you only verbally and only physically with you. But even if you want to learn something better even, still, you still have to go inside, right? In a higher level of consciousness and learn with the inner master, the all-pervading master, not the physical one. The physical one is only a ladder, right? To bring you up to the higher story of consciousness. There you learn with a higher master. Even with the same master or with a different master, but in a higher level of finer consciousness. Understand? Mm-hmm. So the same thing she have told, she has told him here. I understood it because we are in the same path. <laughs> if it were not uh, that we have been uh, studying this inner wisdom, we wouldn't have understand what she meant by going into the realm of the heavenly beings and study with them. And then because in this book they say that, oh, and then afterward Tiloba forsake everything and try hard to go into the heavenly realms and to meet these heavenly beings and study with them. And the road to these heavenly beings is full of trick and full of hardship, but he made it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Similar to us. After initiation, that's not all there is, right? We have to struggle hard. We have to go higher and higher into the realm of higher consciousness, and that takes a lot of courage and time, even to leave away leave alone the meat and alcohol and all that, it is already troublesome for you. And you have to struggle with your family, right? Sometimes family opposition and friendship, friend opposition and the society. Everybody try to uh, trouble you, yeah? They try all kind of things to win you back into the normal stream of activities and of ignorance and don't let you go higher. These are the so-called hardship during the voyage, voyage to the heavenly beings to learn. Understand? And don't expect that you walk all the way to heaven and then uh, now and again you see a, a, <laughs> a Dracula or something standing there and trying to suck your blood. So therefore, after all, I have found out that even white magic or black magic, there is no magic. It's only God is the highest magic. So I always seek God. And then after that, God gives me all the magics, as you already know, hmm? which I don't know. <laughs> Most of you know. In time of trouble, you're free to use my magic. Hmm? Even though I don't use it, but I have them. You can always use them. In, in time of emergency, you can always call to the greatest magician, which is the Supreme Master in the Most High Realm, and you have all the things you need. Is that right? But that by no means, you always pray for this. You only do it when you have nothing else in the store and no more, no other way to solve this problem, okay? You appeal to the ocean of love, hmm? to the ocean of wisdom to help you in time of 
emergency that you could not do it yourself. <laughs> so now we forget about Tilopa, huh? Because Tilopa afterward he has a great disciple which is Naropa, which he he abused and beat and oh do all kind of things. Okay? This is Tilopa. Even the greatest uh knowledgeable man has to go and bow to an old, ugly, uh, hungry, old beggar woman for wisdom. So there's nothing uh, too humble to, for us to go and bow to anyone who has wisdom, who can really give us the way to, uh, the, show us the way to liberation. Hmm? That's all there is, okay? So most of the master of the old time are very poor anyhow. You remember the story I told you? Some of the stories? Huh? Uh, Jesus was a carpenter anyhow, right? He never had so much wealth. And Buddha had a lot of wealth, but he forsook it. And he ran around India and begging for food. So he also became uh, a beggar anyhow. You know what I mean? So most of the master don't possess anything. Hmm? Uh, if they even want to do it, it's also fine. One of the sick masters, the, the tenth master, Gobind Singh, I think, he was very um, illustrious. He keeps his wealth. He looks very wealthy and he wears a lot of jewelry, like a prince. Yes. He never shines from that. And he, um, he looks just like a prince. He always dresses very well and wears a lot of jewelry. Yes. But other sick masters, I go around the country begging for food also. So there is no need to say the master should be this and that or others. No problem. You see the Kwan Yin Bodhisattva, uh, she uh, have a lot of ornaments, yeah? And her hair is very long and beautiful and she wears fine clothes, yeah? And in heaven people are beautiful. Their ornaments are natural, attached to them according to their merit. So there's no need to say the master always have to be poor. It is not necessary so. But most of the master, because of their inner, inner realization, they, they mostly choose the simple life, that's all, you know what I mean? But the master always uh, act accordingly, it doesn't mean always have to be like that. Because if the master are so attached to poverty, or to simple life, or to simple clothing alone, then it's also a kind of attachment. You understand what I mean? Always cling to one, one thing or another extreme then it's also no good, yeah? The master must be detached inside, but outside it doesn't matter. It depends on your situation and your background or whatever you have to do to benefit sentient beings. Then it's fine. Understand what I mean? Mm. So anyhow, this uh, master of the great Teloba was a poor beggar. Yeah? Remember, the story I told you of, uh, there's another master called what? Um, Kabir, huh? He was also the great master of, of, of the princes and kings. And the princess gave her uh, one diamond. <laughs> so he doesn't have to continue his work because his work was, uh, he, he, he made the shoes of the people, you know. And, she th and he was a low class. That is the low class in India. And, and, and the princess thought that's not befitting the master. So she gave, and then she, she stuck it in front of the door, the diamond, so that he can sell it. But he said he didn't want it. He didn't want it. Anyhow, he, she stuck there. She said, if you change your mind, it's there. <laughs> but then, then many years later she came back and she, she saw him still working as a shoes uh, mender, huh? shoes repairer. And she said, what happened to the diamond I gave you? He said, wherever you put it, it's still there. <laughs> so, so it doesn't matter, you know, that uh, a master has to be uh, high class people or wear beautiful clothes or have to be poor. It doesn't matter. In the history of mankind, many masters are kings also. Like King Rama of India, he's also a great master. But he's a king. He rules the whole nation in wisdom, and he also fulfills his uh, duty as master at the same time. But that's hard. It's, of course, it's very difficult. I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Even one job already <laughs> difficult. <laughs> the higher the position, the more, the more people you have to serve. That's the way you should understand about a job. 
about position in the society. But people tend to be more proud of president, presidency than uh, to be proud of just a cleaning garbage uh, can person. You know what I mean? It's the same. He served for one family, and the other served for two, three families in a big manufacturing, and the president served the whole nation, and the master served the whole world. <laughs> Serve the whole nation, the whole world, and the whole universe even. Anybody want anything, I have to do it. Didn't I not? Yeah? Even if you, you forget to put the alarm clock or your alarm clock gone wrong, you say, Master, please wake me up at four o'clock. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> yeah? And when your, your car broke down in the, the, in the highway, please, Master, push it. <laughs> Is that not so? Isn't any job that you didn't tell me to do? Huh? And even uh, I have to become midwife when you <laughs> deliver a baby. Oh, Master, please come. And then the Master also have to do it. Huh? Anything, any sickness, any dirtiness that you cannot bear, any filth in this world, you always ask the Master to clean it for you, no? To do it for you. So the Master is nothing honorable job. So I hope that you have a better understanding about position and job in this world and not to be proud of your higher position, okay? And the true leadership is the one who serves the community wholeheartedly, you know, regardless of what job you do, okay? And today, because we talk about how other disciples right, try to meditate or try to find the Master and how they, how they uh, practice hard in their profession huh? or in their chosen field. Okay, now, there's another disciple, the disciple of, of uh, Milarepa. He has the one famous one called Rechung, you know? You know? You remember how Rechung make, meet Milarepa? I already told you, maybe in Chinese. Anyhow, when Rechung met him, he was a very fine person, you know, a sophisticated and aristocratic person. So very wealthy, you know, well-mannered, uh, well-learned, yeah, and haughty, but arrogant. Mm. When uh, he met uh, his master, uh, Milarupa, Milarupa was um, just uh, standing next to the river, mm? and then uh, asked the till, uh, Rechung, huh? he was uh, riding a fine horse, Rechung at that time, and Milarepa was uh, skinny and, uh, you know, looked very undernourished because he, he don't eat much. Sometimes uh, during the winter he don't eat. He only eat some leaves or things like that. And so he looked very green and hairy, you know, looked like a, <laughs> a devil, a ghost. So Rechung don't even want to look at him. So Milarepa tried to attract his attention because Milarepa knows that he will be his disciple, but Rechung doesn't know. Of course not. Huh? So he come hanging around. <laughs> Rechung and said, "Please, uh, I want to cross the 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 river, but I cannot cross. Can you uh, lend me your horse so I can go the other way? Uh, I'm old, poor old man. Please help me." And Rechung, of course, not answer. Huh? And then he 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 blah blah again about the horse. Uh, Rechung doesn't care. And uh, many times like that, and he hang around and keep begging for Rechung to lend him a horse, but he never did. And he tell people even to throw him out, you know, he's, uh, tell his uh, subordinate to throw the old, ugly, dirty, nuisance, <laughs> talking too much beggar out of his way. And then he tried to run away with a horse, you know. Rechung no, just want to run fast. And Milarepa had no other alternative but to fly across the river. So, okay, if you don't lend me the horse, goodbye. And then he fly across the river, <laughs> you know, on top of the water. That you can do by learning the art called uh, Qing Kong in, in Chinese. Yeah? And you can, you can uh, walk very fast without having any obstacle. Even you can run, you know, like a 90 degree. Uh, war, yeah, or on the mountain, no problem. You run very fast. You run faster than horses and car. Yeah. Probably like car or perhaps a little bit more and car depends on your uh 
your skill. Hmm? You can learn that. Even you can learn that today in China, in Tibet, or maybe in Vietnam, in some of our very remote area of the world, you can learn this. Before they didn't have the transportation, and Tibet is a very peculiar place. Yeah? A vast and people very less, and they have to learn many skills, ancient skills, in order to uh, overcome these obstacles. To, to to do things in a faster way. But I must not encourage you too long because it takes at least 25 years of hard working, arduous training, and all kind of rules, and all kind of tests and beating from the Master, maybe before you are even accepted. All right? And only the excellent one can be accepted and continue even. Even if you learn a half way and your master say you're not fit, then he can even throw you out. And in Tibet, if he throws you out, he throws you out. There's no thing, nothing, nobody ever dare to blame any master in Tibet or India. But uh, in the modern time, <laughs> it's different. In the West world, it's different. People don't respect the master that much. Anyhow, because um, I tell you that, but you probably don't believe me, that how come you learn a halfway, the masters will throw you out. It happened. Like uh, in the book of um, Madame Alexander David Neal, she told a story that she has spent time with one of these people who were thrown out. <laughs> but he already walked very fast. <laughs> it walked so fast that she knows, she recognized immediately that he's one of those, uh, uh, you know, fast walking. When they walk, they just like flying. They don't touch the ground. They probably touch the grass, the top of the grass, or the top of the trees, or the leaves, but they don't touch the ground. They walk like flying. There are some people who fly, there are some people who walk so fast, and when they walk, they don't think of anything, they don't see anything. Even if you were in f uh, next to them, they don't see you, and you better not disturb them because they might die of shock. So it's, there is many side effects. <laughs> that uh, a person who learned this kind of art must consider, you know, it's not that easy. It's not like those Kuan Yin method, you can go to the fifth heaven without any trouble, you know what I mean? Without side effects. Of course you have, you have trouble because of your karma, you know, obstacles from the maya, but it's not from the method itself, you know what I mean? Because then when the people who walk like that, they're like in the trance, their eyes are fixed, in a horizon, in a point of the horizon. They cannot look, they cannot see, they cannot talk. They can only fix their attention, whole attention to that, and then walk. Nothing more, they're just like dead. You know what I mean? So when you suddenly talk or stop them or do something abrupt, they, they might die. They might be in danger, in danger, or die even. Well, that's just what I'm told, okay? <laughs> so in case you want to learn, you consider all this, all right? And if you're still young, you can, but if you're 50, I think you better forget it. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years. <laughs> huh? Oh, study very hard, huh? Very hard. You have to shut yourself sometimes in the, in the, in the mountain cave or to study, or sometimes you shut yourself in the, how to say, in the desert, huh? And then uh, to practice every day, non-stop. Huh? Even one of our disciples, the, the master of uh, Tai Chi Chuan, remember? He studied 30 years and every day he practiced 13 hours. 13 hours every day. Even when he talked to disciples, he talked to his friend, he always moved around, you know, in his own <laughs> in study. Yes, it's just, that's what I say. To become a, a master of Tai Chi Chin, it's not that easy. 30 years, all of a lifetime, all the prime of, cha, of, of youth, and 13 hours every day. Before, his friend always told me, you know, before he became disciples, yeah. His friend told me also, oh, every time we come, it's just like he's not there. He's always doing his things. We, he don't even talk to us that much. And even when he talks, he, he, he moves his hands and feet or, uh, or, who, <laughs> or you, know, you know, doing his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, martial arts uh, movement. Even in sleep, he kick around. <laughs> 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 so, so, even to learn only one art, you have to master that. You have to study for so long. Hmm? In Tibet, some people can do that because they study since childhood in a monastery. But they study, devote or to one kind or two. Uh, very seldom they can master many arts together. You know what I mean? 
So therefore, uh, our meditation is different. We liberate from all this, from all this, uh, you know, tricks and <coughs> magics and all this, uh, because it's, it's not that much use. We can use aeroplane, it's faster, and no side effect. <laughs> Uh, one time uh, the Buddha, the Buddha wanted to cross the river, and there was one person who crossed the river alone without the boatman, and he was boasting about his uh, ability of walking fast and walk. Then he can walk over the river. And so the Buddha tried to cross the river, and that man was bo boasting about his ability and uh, just fly across the river so the Buddha can have a look. And the Buddha said, "But how long you have to practice?" He said, "25 years." And then the Buddha said to the disciple. Why? I can't understand why a person spent 25 years <laughs> for something which ordinary people spend only 25 cents to go across. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why the master of all time discouraged people to practice m magic, because it takes too long for one thing. Oh, we have many magicians amongst disciples, yeah, who can do many kind of things which you cannot believe, which you think is in the book, but after all, they still come and study with this master. <laughs> you know what I mean? The mastership is in having things, having power, and not use it for the bad purpose. It's not that to have a <laughs> the, to master the power and use it any time you want. You know what I mean? Mastership means control yourself, master of your own power. Yeah? Use it only in the beneficial way. Understand what I mean? When we have this mastery of life and death power, we don't bother because everything will run its own course and in own time. We no need to hurry. Understand? No need. Just like I tell you, the tree, the apple, the apple fruit, when its time comes, it will ripe and fall down, eh? and then we can take it, use it. There's no need to force it, all right? Mm. So the, 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 the good, the virtues lie in your mastery of yourself, not the mastery other, over other people, or not to control over people, or, or to frighten other people, but to put yourself in just a tranquil, calm and um, kind position, disposition, understand? Doing things only for the benefit of people. Understand what I mean? So if you want to learn mastership, that is the motive, that's the, the ideal that you have to hold in mind, you know what I mean? Not to try to learn a power and then use it to uh, master other people, but to master your own self. Understand what I mean? Be master means a master of yourself first before you can uh, be a master of anyone else. Should God will that way? Should God want you to have disciples and chose you to be the leader, spiritual leader of his children until they became spiritual leader themselves? Then God will send you disciples. There's no need to rush. There's one person. Because before initiation she has some experience, like she saw the tunnel, you know. <laughs> The tunnel, you know, between life and death, there's a tunnel, and uh, behind that tunnel, when she passed, she saw a man who stayed there with kind, and kindness, and light, and things like that, uh, which is it was a kind of master and teacher something. And then now that she see also herself were initiated by us, and then she saw light and other people think because she told a lot of story like that. People believe that she <laughs> became a master already. And then she also uh, announced that she and the Master are one, and so people believe it. But the tunnel, you can see even when you die. You know, most of the people who die will see that tunnel. If they're not so bad to go to the hell right away, all right? Because you, you, you read some of the books in America, yeah? They make experience with the near-death experience. The dying people, we see the light, see the Master standing there, and see the tunnel. That's all right. It's just an astral experience, it's nothing big deal. And then she already thought she was already a master before she see me even, because she already saw the master <laughs> behind the tunnel. <laughs> but this is a, a very a basic experience when the people who die we, we experience. 
that the good people, you know, the, those who with good conscience, will be met with angel or the, even one of the master, a lower level transformation body of the master of any kind, who take care of that person, try to teach him to the right way, so that he might come back again, be a good person, or to advance further. That is a very normal procedure for the dying person. Hmm? Somebody has to be there and help them. Sometimes their relatives and friends will come and help them also, yeah? But the good one will be met with the angels, yeah? And of course, even you see the lowest angel of the lowest kind, still they are so kind, yet you, that you'll be melted with love. You follow them anywhere you, they want. You have no more resistance then, you know what I mean? Yes. Otherwise, when you die, it's difficult not to remember this word. You remember, the, you read the book, yeah? Some of the people who died and came back again to this world because their time has not yet up, yeah? So the angels send them back again. And after they came back here, even they just saw the astral, astral world, so beautiful, so glorious, that after they came back to this world, they cry off and on for many weeks because they don't want to stay here anymore after seeing the astral world. I told you many times that you have to avoid these tricks of, 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 of ego, yeah? There's no rush to be master of trying to initiate people into this mystery. God will arrange it, okay? Because if you try to rush, you just eat like an apple which is not ripe, it's sour. No good for the apple, no good for you. <laughs> huh? Understand? And then the master also had to help and then make trouble when that person tried. Just let it be, okay? And then your life will be more smooth and according to God's will, you don't plan, you don't rush things, okay? Would be better. Most people, they create karma because they think they do it. They try to rush it. You understand what I mean? A baby is not yet nine months old. You want to you deliver it. Huh? <laughs> Maybe you can. Yes, you can uh, nourish him, but then he grow up, it doesn't look nice and it's terrible. Why rushing? Understand? It's hard to, to, to keep such a baby. Understand what I mean? Mm. Uh, Rachel, how can I be Rachel? So Rachel, after he saw the Mela River flying across the river, and of course then, then he bowed to him and tried to learn from him. Okay? But anyhow, he was one of the most brilliant disciples of Mela River, yeah? Together with uh, another handful. Okay? After he learned with the Master for a long time, he became very enlightened and brilliant. But still, because of his habit of the luxurious life. He always lived in luxury before, you know, he was a kind of aristocratic and lived in luxury. So he see his master always live in the caves, you know, and eating leaves and things, and look, doesn't look like man, half man, half diva and things like that. And he was always disturbed. He said, Master, why don't you go out and preach to millions of people and then let people build big temples for you and luxurious places for you befitting your position. Hmm? And how come you stay in such a filthy place and, you know, very filthy and yourself are filthy and this is not uh, good for reputation and not good for the appearance and uh, everything is no good anyhow. Hmm? Hmm. And then another time he tried to convince his master again to go out uh, into the city and then he would tell other people and himself would build a big temple for him. He don't have to preach, it's okay, just stay in temple. But then Milarepa say, oh, building temples and staying in cities and having a lot of disciples, you know, people come and worship. And like that is not his job. And many people already did it. But Rechung, he was also a fine pandit, the one who very learned, Indian they call it, very learned professor and very you know, elegant in style. He still miss those uh, big party and big lecture hall when everybody clap their hands and anything like that, you know, and glorious surrounding, anything like that. Uh, so he, he, he wants to go back to the city and do some lecturing, become master, a <laughs> thing like that. But the Miller Robert told Richung then that if you have not yet liberated yourself, how can you liberate others? Try not to be hurried, okay? Probably he just 
had too many experiences, you know, seeing the tunnels and <laughs> like, and seeing light and other people seeing light in front of his head or behind his head or inside his head, things like that. I tell you, all of you have light around you. Sometimes you see it, sometimes other people see it, there's no need to make a fuss about it. Yeah, especially when you meditate or when you think of the Master or when you sincerely think of God, you have light around you, very bright. Or when you have retreat, you can see all the disciples have light. All the ordinary day maybe they have put their light in the closet. <laughs> but <laughs> during retreat they wear it. <laughs> so you can occasionally see all of the disciples have light above you, around you, the whole meditation hall are nothing but light, okay? So there's no need to be proud of yourself when people tell you that, oh, you have light around you. That's just a matter of course. If you don't have light, then you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> there's no need to even be proud of it. You know what I mean? Huh? If you practice with me, you are initiated and you say you meditate two and a half hours every day, and if people don't see light around you even, then you should be ashamed, you know what I mean? And when they see light around you, that's a matter of normal. No need to even listen to it twice. Just forget it bit right away. So your ego won't rise up and trouble you. But the trouble is that you like to listen to this. <laughs> People will tell you, oh my God, wow, you are a saint. Your light is about that big around you. <laughs> Two inches, some people measure it 18 inches and all that. I don't know why. You go to meditation hall, you should not bring any measure instrument. <laughs> Rules and inches and all that, throw it at home. No need to know how big, how far, how high your light is. It is a shame. And even let other people, you say, flatter you into arrogance. Yeah? Okay, we go back to Rachel. This one probably see light around him or somebody else told him that he has light around his head. <laughs> that he rushed back to the city, want to build a big temple and be a master, initiate other people. Even though his master tell him not to, he's not ready. But oh, he went to Laza and lecture. And everybody, of course, never heard such thing. Apart from Mila Reba, who else who brought such thing into Tibet? You know what I mean? Uh, and then who else would know many things like that? Just like now, you go out and preach to ordinary people, sometimes just talk in conversation. They already try, try to bow to you. They think you're fantastic. You know what I mean? Because I didn't hear such thing before. Many of our lay disciples who went to uh, Vietnam, huh? not, not our monks and nuns, went to Vietnam just visiting their relatives and friends. And the, the people in Vietnam bow to them calling them Bodhisattva and Buddha and all that because they don't see the Master, they only see them and they already worship the disciples. The, the, well, even the worst one who go to Vietnam become Bodhisattva right away. <laughs> 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 but Rechong here, <laughs> the disciple, <laughs> who has probably lie around his head, yeah, rush out and give lecture in Lhasa. Lhasa is the capital of Tibet at that time and still are now, mm. but under different ownership, okay? Uh, so he went all over Tibet and lectured to everybody, debated with everyone and won all, won all of them, overcome everything. Many kings, yeah, and princes and princes invited Rechong all over places and he was, oh, yes, famous, yes. There is one of the small king, you know, we call Maharaja, probably a uh, local king, yeah, of Tibet was so fascinated by Rachel and his eloquence and his lecture, which he learned from his master, yeah. yes. <laughs> and his power, which he borrowed from his master, <laughs> etc., etc. was so fascinated that he kept Rachel next to him. He don't want to let him go. And he even tell him to marry his daughter and give his daughter to him as wife. And then, uh, there were big, 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 big temple for, for Rechung, yeah, next to his uh, palace, of course. Beautiful, beautiful. He has the only daughter also give to him as a wife. Uh, these things happened before Chongkapa, huh? you know? Chongkapa came after this, uh, and then 
corrected all the tradition in Tibet and don't let the monks mar marry anymore. Before that, monks can marry, okay? So let you marry this princess and uh, stay in this glorious, beautiful, magnificent temple next to the palace and that and this, but, and, and enjoy the glory and the fame. But his wife was a devil with all the proper meaning of a devil. Mm. So she abused him, even beat him and scold him and I would say slander him every day. Mm. Because she thinks if without her she he's nothing. You know, she I rely on her wealth and, you know, her position and, you know, look down upon him. Yes. Rechung was an excellent, eloquent, learned lecturer. But in front of her, he is speechless. <laughs> he cannot talk even. He, he talk, you know, broken in his throat. His language is broken. He cannot do anything with her because she's so vicious. And she even forbid uh, all of his friends or his relatives, anybody, come to him. He, she forbid him even to go out lecture. Anyone who comes to see him, she told the, the, the subordinate, you know, throw them out, beat them out, <laughs> scold them out. <laughs> so nobody can come near uh, Rei Chung. And she's the only one that <laughs> can control abuse, beat him, scold him, slander him, and uh, they degrade him. And uh, he's a very fine monk and beautiful, handsome, uh, elegant, live in a luxurious, glorious house, but no, no power. Hmm? Uh, he was very patient and tried to endure all this, all this. Until one day, his wife argued with him and took the knife <laughs> and wanted to kill him. <laughs> and now she uh, stabbed him and saw the blood ooze out. And instead of blood in the, reg the legion, it says that the white stuff comes out. Supposed to be he's a very enlightened person, so he has no more blood. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after that, huh, he became very uh, repentant. He remembered his master and the good friends in the mountain, a good disciple. So he went back there, studied with him, think no more of the uh, luxurious life, luxurious life. And then became, of course, uh, mm, he, uh, he's the, the, the big disciple of Milarepa, huh? And all of the story of Milarepa is him, Rechung, who wrote and recorded. Yeah. <laughs>